Did we just witness another banking collapse narrowly avoided with the dissolution of First Republic? Or have the banks and the Fed just merely pushed the inevitable disaster a little further down the road? Is Ukraine getting results even as they are bogged down by wet weather and mud? Russian leadership may be showing more cracks. Why we should be paying attention to a possible new front opening up in Sudan, the warnings from experts on artificial intelligence, and another great giveaway that you can be eligible for all in this video on the prepping news that you need to know. Banks collapsing. In March, when we gave you a heads up about Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failing, we warned you that the bank, First Republic, might be next. Well, today, First Republic is no more. JP Morgan bought them from receivership, and their 84 offices in eight states will eventually reopen as JP Morgan Banks. Now, some say this is the end of the banking crisis, which began in March, but that's definitely premature to say. Banking is still dangerously full of bad loans. Nobody can say with absolute certainty whether we are out of the woods or they have just managed to create a more significant problem that we're all going to suffer from later on down the road. Now, allegedly, the bidding process for the behemoth JP Morgan and smaller regional banks was highly competitive. And at the end of the day, JP Morgan had the clearest banking sheets and the best ability to absorb First Republic's losses and deposits. Now, regional banks are warning that it makes JP Morgan too big to fail, which is a phrase that we all learned in the 2008 cycles of bank failures. JP Morgan already holds over 10% of the nation's total bank deposits. It is perhaps not wise to put so many eggs in just one basket. JP Morgan will assume all of First Republic's 92 billion deposits, insured and uninsured. It's also buying most of the bank's assets, including about 173 billion loans and 30 billion in securities. If you had shares of First Republic in your personal or managed retirement account, well, those are now worthless. Since March, we have witnessed quite a bit of forced consolidation amongst banks as one fells and is absorbed and bought by another. Now, this is all coming due to the Fed's consistent interest rate hikes. By tightening financial conditions, by raising interest rates to curb inflation, the Fed has really contributed to a spat of banking failures. That's undeniable, and they're likely to raise rates another quarter point following their meetings on May 2nd. Your job security, your portfolio, debts, and the economy's direction, they're all subject to the Fed's influence. They're not solely to blame for this predicament, however. Banks have continued to make promises on a rate of return that they simply could not provide. Banks took too much advantage of the time when interest rates were artificially held to around zero and took on risky loans. And there are more than a few indicators that we are not out of the woods yet. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon seems to think so, but the banking system still faces several threats. A deepening recession, overexposure to commercial real estate, significant mismatches in asset and liability management, and liquidity, they're all problems that persist into this new fiscal quarter. Now, some of the riskier liabilities, they can be shed in the transition process or shifted to the Fed or the FDIC, or more accurately, to you and I, the taxpayer. But still, much of the risky liabilities simply transition to the balance sheets of these larger banks. Think of it like paying off one credit card with another. You really haven't reduced your debt by doing that. You might save a few points of interest, but you're also delaying the repayment and likely taking on more debt in the process. Now, despite Federal Reserve's officials' efforts to reassure the public about the stability of the U.S. banking system, there really remains a lack of trust in their statements. Now, one of the reasons for this is that Fed Chair Jerome Powell made similar assertions to Congress only days before the collapse of Silicon Valley and Signature Banks back in March. And as the billionaire Charlie Munger warned, in the good times, you get into bad habits. And when bad times come, they lose too much. The 99-year-old investor, best known for being the other half of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, he warns that American banks are full of what he said were bad loans, even as property prices fall. Does he see what the Fed regulators and bank executives don't want to admit? In 2008, regulators did not see the potential for contagion from a subprime crisis, nor did they see the possibility of the resulting nationwide residential real estate meltdown. Now, these troubles have raised fears of a knock-on impact on commercial real estate when banks turn more conservative on lending. The general consensus is that the Fed will raise interest rates at least one final time at the beginning of May. So you can bet that banks are doing everything they can right now to really improve their balance sheets by dumping or repackaging and selling off loans and other toxic assets. Some of them won't be successful ahead of the Fed's next hike. So it's possible we could see even more banks faltering in May and through early summer. 
there are still numerous unknowns really at this point. The first is how overexposed banks might be to commercial real estate bubbles and how close we all are to that bubble popping, even as bankers are beginning to admit that it's a problem looming in the future. Now, secondly, we don't really know how long the global recession and the war in Ukraine is going to last. These will infuse uncertainty into economies worldwide, even as they drain away any modest gains. First Republic's absorption into JP Morgan may not be the end of the banking crisis. It may be more like simply bailing water from one boat and putting it into a bigger boat. Time will tell, but you may want to look at your bank's exposure to commercial real estate, just as you should look at their deposits and liabilities, at least for now. The Fed and the CEO of JP Morgan would like you to believe everything is just fine. Now, I don't get financial advice on this channel, but I think even a blind man can see storm clouds still in our future. And I don't think we have seen the worst of the banking crisis yet. At this point, we may have only experienced just phase one. This disappearance of First National Bank may have just merely calmed things now and really kicked a much larger problem down the road a bit further. Eventually, we will have to face the problem again. Russia, Ukraine. The United States is installing sensors in Ukraine that can detect sudden bursts of radiation from a nuclear weapon or dirty bomb and can also identify the source of the attack. Now, one of the aims is to ensure that if Russia were to set off a radioactive weapon on Ukrainian territory, its nuclear signature could be confirmed, thereby attributing responsibility to Moscow. As Washington prepares for the worst possible outcome of the war, these sensors have the ability to characterize the size, location, and effects of any nuclear explosion. They would eliminate Putin's ability to deny culpability. It's a grim possibility that Putin will adopt a scorched earth policy if he is forced to surrender more of Ukraine back, including possibly Crimea. Now, these sensors will hopefully deter Moscow from attempting to create a false flag operation. Russia blames Ukraine for a drone attack on a significant Crimea fuel depot. According to a military intelligence official in Ukraine, over 10 storage tanks containing approximately 40,000 tons of oil products, which were meant for use by Russia's Black Sea Fleet, were demolished. Now, the Russian installed governor of the region has said that one drone struck and the fire was put out before a disaster occurred. Photos showing smoke billowing into the sky favored Ukraine's account. Now, Ukraine also indicates that the attack was part of Ukraine's preparations for a counteroffensive. The long-awaited counteroffensive has been delayed because of an unusually high level of rain, which continues to make the ground too muddy to move the multiple ton equipment needed effectively. Now, mud may also be why Russia has been unable to make any significant advances. The presence of mud can impede an attack by limiting the options available to the attackers, making it more difficult to supply logistics to the front lines. And this can be especially challenging for the attacking side compared to the defender. Now, Russia has been capable of carrying out lethal attacks in regions far from the front lines, such as the area assault on Friday, which resulted in the deaths of over 25 individuals. Nevertheless, Despite incurring significant losses on both sides, Russia has not been able to breach the Ukrainian defenses in the eastern region, achieving only minor advancements. Russia has also had some high-level leadership changes as well. Their head of the logistics, nicknamed the Butcher of Maripol, was replaced just after seven months on the job. Now, the high-level shakeup may also be the beginning. Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group, is once again causing embarrassment to the Kremlin and endangering Vladimir Putin's military campaign by issuing threats to sabotage it. Prigozhin derided and blamed his foe, Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu, for a lack of ammunition that he said would cost Russia the war. Now, he issued a brazen ultimatum threatening to pull his mercenaries out of Bakhmut if the defense minister did not immediately provide the required ammunition. Now, it may have shades of truth, but we must acknowledge that most of what Prigozhin says is typically intended to obfuscate and mislead. Rarely do any of these negative headlines ever get seen in Russia. They are often just meant to distort international opinion. While he claims that the Wagner Group may cease to exist, as we covered in another video, it's more likely that he's trying to just simply reformulate and change its name. Allegedly, this infighting has gone far beyond just a mere exchange of words. Reportedly, there was a shootout between Russian soldiers and mercenaries from the Wagner Group in the settlement of Lahanska, with each side attempting to hold the other responsible for Russia's setbacks in the ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Now, Russia has not confirmed Ukraine's claims, which could not be independently verified. Now, even if it's remotely true, however, it doesn't really bode well for Russian cohesion, even as the Ukrainian counteroffensive gets ever closer. China still hopes to broker a peace deal 
and is sending its senior Chinese diplomat, Li Xiu, to Europe to try and convince Western allies that a peace deal is possible. Now, Ukraine wants a complete return of its territory, including Crimea, and Putin is not planning any willfully ceding any territory back to Ukraine. China has not denounced the invasion and continues to purchase Russian oil at premium rates, providing an advantage to Putin. And additionally, while not overtly providing lethal weight in the open, China is still supplying dual-use items. To demonstrate their ability to act as an impartial mediator, China must take concrete action. China hopes to ride the fence for as long as possible until a victory can be determined, and all while profiting from it wherever they may. The European Union and NATO, they promise a path to membership for Ukraine once the conflict is resolved. Now, rebuilding a devastated Ukraine and then integrating it completely into the European Union is going to come at a considerable cost, resulting in some nations transitioning from net beneficiaries to net contributors of the EU budget. Furthermore, this move is anticipated to move Europe's center of influence toward the east, which could significantly alter the power dynamic within the bloc. What do you think? Is peace possible, or does one side have to completely lose in this conflict before it is ever resolved? Let us know your take in the comments section below. Sudan. The new front of this war may be in Sudan. Russia secured mining rights in Sudan as far back as 2018. Wagner has operated in Africa since 2017, becoming more involved in Sudan after a meeting in Sochi between Putin and the then Sudanese leader, Omar al-Bashir. In another chapter of their seemingly never-ending civil war with following Omar Bashir's ouster, two generals are pitted against each other. Now, the Wagner Group supplied both of the warring generals, and Russia has an agreement to build a naval base in the Red Sea. However, building the naval base necessitates parliamentary approval, which would require Sudan to establish a civilian parliament first. Russia is unwilling to wait for the procedures of democracy to unfold, but any Wagner-supported, friendly warring general who seizes power, regardless of the genocide that may occur with Wagner-supported weapons, is more likely to approve a Russian naval base than an elected parliament. It's also believed that Russia has been smuggling gold out of Sudan for quite some time. In 2021, a Sudanese general prevented the search of a plane operated by the Russian military. After last year's military coup, Sudanese officials, who were members of an anti-corruption organization that was disbanded, speculated that the aircraft in question was one of several Russian military planes engaged in transporting gold illegally from Sudan to Moscow. Now, to further its efforts to win over African countries, Russia has promised 500,000 tons of grain that they couldn't sell to the rest of the world to Africa. And the move is partially to win over African nations and partially to replace Ukraine as a grain provider. We're going to continue to monitor Russia's actions in Africa, especially in Sudan. And while I don't think Western nations will likely swoop in and force a resolution to the conflict there, it will impact the world if the Wagner Group is allowed to establish a foothold there and through a naval base on Sudan's shore with the Red Sea. What do you think? Should we be more concerned with Wagner's presence in Sudan? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below giveaway. For this week's giveaway, we're going to be giving away a dual fuel portable stove. And to be eligible for a chance to win in this giveaway, just simply post a comment below and then click the like button. And for the next video later this week, I'll use a tool to draw a winner from the comments on this video randomly. For the last video's winner of the 12 pack of portable water purifier packs, the winner is a subscriber, Thomas Langford. I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. Artificial intelligence. A man considered the godfather of AI has left Google and warned of danger ahead as humanity faces an ever-growing AI threat. Now, Joffrey Hinton wasn't an artificial intelligence pioneer. Now, Monday, at the time of recording this video, he became part of a growing group of critics who believe that corporations are heading toward danger with their ambitious efforts to develop generative artificial intelligence-based products, which are responsible for powering popular chatbots such as ChatGPT. Now, as companies improve their AI systems, he believes they become increasingly dangerous. He said this, Look at how it was five years ago and how it is now, he said, of AI technology. Take the difference and propagate it forwards. That's scary. Hinton is best known for an algorithm called backpropagation, which he first proposed with two colleagues in the 1980s. Now, the technique, which allows artificial neural networks to learn, really underpins nearly all machine learning models. If there is one person that I think we should really heed, it's a man whose team essentially pioneered the field of machine learning and artificial neural networks. The onus to act responsibly and ethically with the creation and use of AI is on the companies developing it. And as we're constantly reminded, 
once something ends up on the internet. It stays there for better or for worse. You can also say that such content is largely beyond the control of any particular individual or organization. Already, there have been some high-profile misuse of AI where company data made it into the training of the AI. And while three of the instances were Samsung's corporate data, it could have just as easily been your customer data and information. And while it would be easy to assume that AI cannot impact our lives because we think we don't use that much technology in our daily lives, that would be a wrong assumption. And as we will show in a video release later this week, AI is something you absolutely have to prepare for. Fortunately, there are things that you can do now, and we're gonna show you what you can do in that coming video. Privacy experts, they've expressed their apprehension over potential situations where someone might share private legal documents, medical information, contact details, or any other sensitive data with an AI chatbot. And their concern stems from the developer's advice to abstain from disclosing any sensitive information to any AI chatbot. As the developers, they can't really erase specific prompts from users' chat history. And you don't have to engage with AI to be negatively impacted by it either. You're not going to want to miss our video coming out this week on how you can protect yourself from AI. So definitely subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. What do you think? Should we be paying attention to AI's meteoric and unguarded rise? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And again, definitely watch the video that we'll release later this week. As always, stay safe out there.